Jakob Ries was born in Riba in 1849, and he came to the United States when he was 20 in 1870. Um, I've, of course, learned a great deal about the context of that, which he doesn't provide, and which has been very useful for me to understand that he was part of the major migration from uh, Denmark. And he died in 1914. During his lifetime in the United States, he was a national celebrity. Uh, next slide. Today, most New Yorkers know his name because of two things. One is a waterside park in Queens, uh, which opened in 1936. And uh, this is a picture of uh, the, the park now. Uh, this is an old um, sort of Art Deco bathhouse uh, that was original and that's been actually uh, fairly recently renovated. Um, and so everybody in New York, if they know nothing about history, know of Jacob Reese Park. So there's name recognition. Um, and the next slide is another um, thing that's named for Reese in New York, which is a uh, low-income housing project, which opened in 1949. Uh, the reformers of the Depression era uh, read How the Other Half Lives, his book, and found great inspiration in it and sort of revived interest in him. And that's why these institutional, um, uh, um, you know, the housing project and the, and the park were named for him. Um, Next slide. Today, um, his bestseller of 1890, How the Other Half Lives, um, is a classic American text uh, and is just continuously being reprinted. And what I'm just showing you is the, a copy of the original 1890 text. Um, and I just looked online on Amazon. You can see this is a clip from Amazon. Uh, and this is a February 19, 2015 <laughs> Kindle version of How the Other Half Lives. So it just shows you that it's just constant. You turn around and there's another edition of How the Other Half Lives in print. Um, there's also a vast literature on Reese. There's even a book-length bibliography of writings about Reese. that was published in the 1970s. And here we are 40 years later um, with still a lot more published about him. He has come to represent many things to many people. And the heart of this project has been a definitive study of the photographs. And then, thanks to the Library of Congress, uh, a, 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 a careful study of um, his archive as well. Now, of course, I had to study the archive to do my work, but to the very fact that I had to basically study it all over again in order to think about it in terms of how the uh, objects from the collection could be um, assembled to help enhance the story. By comparison, there's been little interest in Reese in Denmark. Um, and the anniversary of his birth, 1949, his son uh, and widow, um, organized many centennial events in the United States and also in Denmark. And there is a kindergarten in Reba that's named for him, which I got to see when I was there, which was thrilling. He was a very early and vocal advocate of the kindergartens uh, and, and early childhood education. And so there is that institution, which is thriving and apparently hard to get into um, in Reba today. So uh, those are, and, 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 but in recent years, there has been more interest. Um, there was an exhibition at the Royal Library, which some of you may know about or have seen, in 2008. Um, I didn't see the show. I did talk with the organizers when they came to uh, visit and do research. Um, and then an excellent biography by Tom Book Swenty. Um, and I think that's the next slide. I have the cover of that book. Um, and currently, there are plans for a house museum. Um, in Reba, in his family's home, uh, Fleming Just, who is the uh, director of the Museums of South Jutland, um, is hoping to uh, develop the house into uh, a museum dedicated to Reese and to photography. Um, so we are hoping that when the, our show goes to Denmark, it will introduce Reese or reintroduce Reese or give Reese a deeper under, a, a, the Danish public a deeper understanding of his career in America. So what follows is a very brief summary of uh, what, why we remember Reese um, and what the goals of the upcoming project are. Um, in the 1880s, Reese was a police reporter working at night. Um, <clears throat> with his office right next to police headquarters on Mulberry Street in Lower Manhattan, which was at the time one of the worst slums of the city. He was very ambitious as a reporter, and he was a very colorful writer. And this was a time, as I'm sure any of you have thought, read about um, the 
waves of immigration to the United States. No, a time of massive immigration from southern and eastern Europe, from Italians, from southern Italy, from southern Italy, Jews primarily from eastern Europe, but other groups as well, Polish, Bohemians, Czechs, uh, well, Bohemians. Um, and so the city was booming economically, but there was not enough housing and there was an endless labor supply. So this was a sort of perfect storm for poverty. Um, Rees turned his attention from just reporting crimes, I mean, literally reporting on suicides, fires, burglaries, uh, murders, uh, to um, focusing on housing reform. Uh, this was an era of enormous tenement construction um, in which buildings were simply put up to maximize the number of people that could live on a given lot. So there was uh, often no light no circulating air, uh, almost no or almost no plumbing, uh, and these are six-story buildings. Um, so, um, and no garbage pickup, people had animals in the basement. Um, you know, it was not, it was, it was not tenable situation at all. And also people took borders in order to help pay their rent. So that even if a building was built with four apartments to a floor, there could be as many as 100 people in that space. So it was really, it was the worst housing crisis on the planet at this time. And by 1884, Reese was writing more and more as an advocate for a cause. His pitch was basically without decent homes, uh, children will turn to gangs and crime, uh, women will turn to, girls will turn to prostitution, um, and that he put, he lodged the, he, he saw as the source of the problem this housing situation. Um, and that, uh, that this was really the core problem. Um, uh, and also outdoor space. He was very, very committed to playgrounds, to parks, um, all of which, by the way, was conditioned by his childhood, you know, in a sort of uh, urban life, but in a sort of much more rural, rural environment. Um, <clears throat> so um, he felt the sort of ineffectiveness of his writing. Uh, in 1882 to affect change. And in 1887, he read about a new discovery. Flashlight photography was a German invention that would allow a flash of light to uh, uh, occur simultaneous with the uh, exposure of a photographic negative, and that through this process, it was possible to photograph in dark places. So he read about this, and he said, aha, you know, eureka moment, this is going to make the difference. Now, he had no intention of becoming a photographer himself. He reached out to a friend at the Board of Health who knew some amateur photographers at the uh, Society of Amateur Photographers of New York, and they went out with him. Uh, with a member of the sanitary police and basically did raids in uh, illegal lodging houses primarily um, in some of the tough neighborhoods. He, of course, served as guide and essentially as art director saying, you know, this is what I want, this is what I want. But he didn't take his, you know, his the original pictures at all and had really no intention of learning. Um, the, the amateurs that he was dealing with arranged for him to give an illustrated lecture at their society, and he showed 100 pictures and spoke for two hours. And being a newspaper man, brought in the press. Uh, and there was great coverage of this in the newspapers. There was three detailed articles about his lecture in the local press, which then led to more uh, <coughs> lecture uh, invitations. Um, he, uh, often with church groups and with uh, charitable groups, um, and um, from that he uh, had the opportunity to uh, write a long article for a national magazine, Scribner's Magazine, it was an illustrated magazine, and then the, that, from that article, Scribner's, which also was a book publisher, asked him to write a full-length book, and he published this book, How the Other Half Lives, in 1890, and as he would say, that's where it all began. You know, that's what really changed his life. Now, he continued to work as a crime reporter until 1899, so he was doing, he was a regular beat reporter throughout the, the, all of his years um, working as a social reformer, but, um, <clears throat> which some people don't think, uh, don't know, but um, it's an important part. But he continually wrote more and more for uh, magazines as well as the newspapers, and ultimately wrote 10 books. So, I mean, he had a very 
Uh, he was a writer, is what I'm trying to say. But with his photography, what happened was um, those original amateurs, after they went out sort of slumming with him on a few of these trips, lost interest. And then he actually hired a professional to help. And the professional actually started marketing his pictures. Uh, and so then he had to actually go to court to get his negatives back. And then finally, he learned to use the camera, a simple camera himself. Um, that said, he never learned to do darkroom work. He would always use just go to a commercial photographer and have his negatives developed and have prints made for publication and have lantern slides made for his lectures. So his photography consisted of his using this very simple camera, uh, actually for a very short few years. Um, and, but as, and this should be put in a context of a long career as a writer. Uh, the next slide. So this is an example of uh, one of those pictures from that time. Uh, this is a sweatshop on Ludlow Street in what was called Jew Jewtown, a neighborhood around Hester and Ludlow and Orchard. Um, the next slide, these are just a couple of examples. Uh, this is um, a, a picture of what was called a black and tan dive, uh, which was where the races mixed, uh, which he frowned upon uh, as being uh, worse than just the regular dives uh, uh, and, and wrote about it in that way. Um, you can see these are like sort of cellar rooms um, where people often had no place to sleep and they would stay there all night. Uh, the next is another example. This one is called Five Cents a Spot. This was an illegal lodging house. The title is refers to the fact that um, uh, <coughs> um, that uh, the, there was a law that you had to, um, the least you could charge for giving people a room for the night was seven cents. And for that, you had to provide a sort of canvas hammock uh, to sleep on. And this was below that level, both in terms of cost and in terms of the conditions. Um, and I just want to read to you, this is the, what this sort of project does that it hasn't been done, uh, particularly which is to match up uh, the images with his writing. This describes this room. In a room not 13 feet either way slept 12 men and women, two or three in bunks set in a sort of alcove. The rest on the floor, a kerosene lamp burned dimly in the fearful atmosphere, probably to guide other and later arrivals to their beds, in quotes. For it was only just past midnight. A baby's fretful wail came from an adjoining room, hall room, where in the semi-darkness three recumbent figures could be excuse me, could be made out. Most of the men were lodgers who slept there for five cents a spot. So I hope that you see how the words really enhance your understanding of what you're seeing here. Um, it's a very disturbing picture. Uh, it's chaotic in its organization. Uh, and that's kind of the point. These people are taken by surprise with the flash. So they're kind of in a semi-conscious state and uh, surprised by the camera. Um, all of which gives a kind of phantasmagoric sense of how, uh, of what the life was like, which was very much the point. Um, so um, let's see. So the next slide, though, will show you how this is how the picture showed up in the article, How the Other Half Lives, and Scribner's, and then the book, um, which is to say that at this time, the technology of reproduction was not yet developed to be able to show photographs as photographs. They had, artists would make wood engravings um, after the pictures, um, and so they appeared like this. So the way recent, and then there was, the, this is exactly the moment when the halftone reproduction, which is the photographic reproduction of a photograph, you know, that looks like photograph with a full tonal range, was just being developed. But in the time of his famous book, this was so, such, you know, so primitive that it was not effective. So when people talk about the influence of Reese's photographs, it was not through his books, because people didn't really experience the photographs that way. The way they experienced his photographs was through his lectures. And the next slide, please. Um, this is uh, just a, a, a very, is, this is to show what a magic lantern slideshow look like. This is in a very big hall with a very big audience. But it gives you the idea of how the pictures would have been seen. You would sit in a darkened hall, and the images would appear basically projected on a wall or a screen over life size. Um, so that if you can imagine seeing five cents a spot in 1890 like that, 
basically is an environmentally scaled picture. It's a pretty terrifying vision. And so that was the way his pictures were really, un could be, were best seen in his day. And it's, it's very important to emphasize this lecturing because uh, lantern side lectures were a popular form of entertain family entertainment at the time. There was uh, lecture halls. These were, these were held all over the country. Um, there were booking agents that booked them. The topics would be um, science, history, religion, fiction that were illustrated often with paintings. Um, and so you know, you'd, you'd come and, and hear a speech illustrated. There was music. Uh, there were very special effects. Um, it's a really it's a pre-cinema experience. And as Reese became more famous and more well known, he was part of this circuit, you know, where he would be booked by a bureau. The agent would take a cut of his, uh, the take from, you know, what his payment, and, uh, you know, he gave these uh, all over the country, and he spent a few months of every year till the rest of his life, until 1914, lecturing like this. So it's an ephemeral art. You know, we can't see it, but this is the way his work was, uh, was best experienced. At least the images were best experienced. And also he thought what he did was he would give lectures and then he would adapt his lectures into his writings. So the whole idea of the illustrated lecture was kind of fundamental to the way he presented all of his material. Um, so the up, our upcoming exhibit aims to give today's audience some sense of a Reese lecture uh, in what we're, we're calling a lay sermon. Uh, Reese spoke off the cuff, so there are no notes to rely on. We don't have like scripts. Um, but there's one published transcription of his lecture, How the Other Half Lives. And based on that, we have developed uh, working with a professional, if you can believe this, professional magic lantern slide performer, uh, an incredible, incredibly gifted and um, uh, um, knowledgeable man named Terry Borton, who lives in Connecticut. He has taken that transcript and reduced it to a script, which he is reading, uh, and is going to be an eight-minute presentation in the exhibition, which I think is going to be you know, a highlight, because people will get an, uh, some sense of what this uh, was like. Um, and we'll also show some of the wonderful scrapbooks because uh, Reese kept everything. So there's uh, reviews of all of his lectures. This is an example of a scrapbook page. This particular one is, is lovely. It says press comments on the lecture, the other half, and how and ha the other half how it lives and dies in New York, which was actually his original title. Um, so we'll have a lot of this wonderful material in the exhibition, which brings sort of Reese alive as a man. Uh, and uh, also he, you know, he notated all of his, you know, he told the story, he argued with the, the clippings, all of that. There'll be selections like that in the exhibition to give you a sense of, of, uh, of, of who he was. He also had wonderful handwriting. I love it. <laughs> it's always with that black pen. Um, so Reese is best known for his first book, How the Other Half Lives, which features those flash photographs like the ones I showed you, and was structured like a slum tour, neighborhood by neighborhood, Jewtown, uh, Chinatown, Bohemians, you know, by these different, the Italians, uh, Mulberry Bend, which was right near his office that was an Italian neighborhood, um, very sinister and, um, and scary. Um, and so you know, that, that was arranged in that way. Um, and, but one of the goals of the exhibition is to show um, that his photography evolved away from this approach. The next slide. Um, Reese wrote a sequel to How the Other Half Lives called The Children of the Poor, which was published in 1892. And he used the camera most between 1888 and 92, taking photographs that illustrated his, his, this new book and also many newspaper and magazines articles. And perhaps because he was focused on children, Reese changed his photographic approach. Instead of using flash and taking his subjects by surprise, he uh, would speak to them and earn their trust and while he was setting up the camera, would continue to talk to them and take their picture, and uh, then um, incorporate these stories into, um, into his writing. So I'm going to just read you what he writes about Katie, and then that will be the end of this type of you know, sort of academic <laughs> transcription. But I want you to get an idea of the change. I found little Katie, age nine, in a 49th Street tenement, keeping house for her older sister and two brothers, all of whom worked in a hammock factory, earning from 150 to 450 a week. They had moved together when their mother died, and the father brought home another wife. Their combined income was something like $9.50 a week, and the simple furniture was bought on installment. 
but it was all clean of poor. Katie did the cleaning and the cooking of the plain kind. She scrubbed and swept and went to school, all as a matter of course, and ran the house generally. The picture shows what a sober, patient, sturdy little thing she was with that dull life wearing on her day by day. She got right up when asked and stood for her picture without a question and without a smile. What kind of work do you do, I asked, thinking to interest her while I made ready. I scrubs, she replied promptly, and her look guaranteed that what she scrubbed came out clean. Um, so, um, and the, so the later career of Reese is known, this is a known story, but still his influence is reduced to this book, you know, How the Other Half Lives from 1890. So uh, another point, and this is my last point, is to uh, explain that this was really the start of historian, not the end. Um, in 1896, uh, William Strong, a good government candidate, defeated the Democratic machine to become mayor of New York. Strong appointed Theodore Roosevelt as police commissioner. Roosevelt befriended Reese, whose office was just across Mulberry Street from police headquarters. And Reese mentored Roosevelt in, uh, in matters of street crime and urban poverty. With access to political power through Roosevelt, Reese influenced policy in myriad ways, including the demolition of the worst of the tenements, the closing of the police lodging houses, which was where uh, the only place the homeless could sleep that the city provided and which were horrendous. Um, and the construction of three small urban parks in Lower East Side of New York, which are still there. Um, the next slide. Um, the strong administration only lasted one term, but many important reforms were established. And looking back on a decade of reform, Reese published The Battle with the Slum and toured the country giving lectures on it. So this is the cover of the first edition, and this is actually a lantern slide in his collection, which is a poster for his lecturing on the, that book. Uh, the next slide. Slide. Uh, Reese also wrote an autobiography, The Making of an American, which was another bestseller, as much of a bestseller as How the Other Half Lives. The story affirmed the most romantic view of the American experience, what we now call the American dream of a homeless immigrant achieving greatness. The story went well beyond expectation because of two irresistible components, a quixotic love story and a friendship with a man who lived in the White House. The next one. Reese left Denmark not because of political oppression or poverty, but for love. As a teenager, he had developed a crush on Elizabeth Gertz, the ward of the wealthiest man in Reeb. Rashly, Reese had the idea that if he could go to America and make good, he would marry her. Against all odds, his plan worked. It took him five years to succeed. Uh, she had been disowned by her guardian and was still unmarried when he asked for her hand in 1875. Reese milked this story for all it was worth, <laughs> even turning the narrative of the book over to Elizabeth. There's a chapter in the book written by her called Elizabeth's Story. The book was published in 1901, which was their 25th wedding anniversary. Uh, and she, as well as he, became national celebrities. Um, the next slide. In that same year, President William McKinley was assassinated, and his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, became president. So one of uh, so here is this who could have predicted that. So here these two stories. He's got the pre friendship with the president, trips to the White House, and this fantastic love story. So it sort of went far beyond the expectation of the sort of upwardly mobile immigrant story. Um, so. Uh, one of the more charming letters that's going to be in the exhibition, which is in the Reese's archive, um, is a letter on White House stationery dated November 1st, 1901, in which Teddy Roosevelt writes, Dear Jake, when are you going to be in Washington? I really must see you here in the White House not too long hence. I am getting homesick for you. Faithfully yours, Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> So Reese's story was written with characteristic charm and wit and was irresistible. So that, 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 in, so that launched a whole other book tour, you know, essentially a book tour, right, giving another lecture on his life story. Now that's another piece of the exhibition. We're taking some of his slides, this I haven't done yet, um, but we're going to have on a monitor a little biography of Reese, but based on the making of an American and using a selection of the slides that he showed in his lecture, again, to try to give people a sense of how, uh, how of this medium and how important it was for the time. Reese's use of the media for self-promotion seems very modern. 
Although uh, Roosevelt and Reese truly loved each other, their friendship was also based on self-interest. Roosevelt repeatedly referred to Reese in print as the ideal American citizen, which became his sort of moniker and which he, you know, promoted him. And Reese wrote feature stories on Mrs. Roosevelt and the family for the Ladies Home Journal. Um, and when uh, Roosevelt ran for president in 1908, Reese wrote a full-blown campaign biography. The last, I think this is the last slide. Um, a theme which will not be particularly developed in the American version of the exhibition is Reese's lifelong commitment to his Danish heritage. From the beginning of his career as a journalist, Reese wrote about Denmark for the American press, for the American audience. And in 1909, partly as a collection of published stories and some new ones, he published a book of these stories called Old Town, which is all about Reeb. And so my hope is that in the Den Danish version of this book, that that story can be flushed out. I hope with help you know, from Danish curators that we can make more of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.